Good afternoon. It's so wonderful to welcome you to our first webinar of 2021. Uh, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to meet in person as yet, uh, my name is Caroline Wilkie and I am the CEO of the Australasian Railway Association. Welcome to our webinar today on Faster Rail. We have had a huge response from um, our members for today's webinar. Uh, it's obviously a very popular topic with over 400 people registered to attend today, so welcome. First of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. For me, based here in Canberra, it is the Ngunnawal people, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. The issues we'll be discussing today go to the heart of how rail can support the sustainable growth of our biggest cities and their neighbouring regions. In the, past, in the next 40 years, we're expecting to see 10 million people move to Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane. Neighbouring regional centres like Geelong, Newcastle and the Gold Coast will be a key part of this growth strategy. Today's report looks at how we can make sure that those regions are as connected as possible to their capital cities. It makes the case for faster, more reliable and more frequent services to support the sustainable development of our cities and promote growth in our regions. And no time has that ever been more important than now in a, in a semi-post-COVID world. It will come as no surprise that rail investment has lagged behind road funding for decades now, and our regional rail networks are quite frankly too slow. Today's report confirms that we need to invest in our existing network to increase the speed, reliability and frequency of our rail services. This is a necessary first step as we prepare for dedicated fast rail lines over the next decade and look ahead to a long-term vision for high-speed rail. You will soon hear about how new consumer research commissioned by the ARA has found many of us are looking to move out of the city as our lives and our working hours and the nature of our work has changed. This is a wonderful opportunity and a real opportunity to spark new regional development as part of our recovery from the pandemic. Victorians will have the chance to see this firsthand as the Geelong Fast Rail project gets underway in the next couple of years. I'd like to thank Arup for their work in preparing this comprehensive piece of research for us, as well as our panel for joining us here today. For now, I will hand over to our General Manager, Director of Corporate Services and Passenger Rail, Emma Woods, who has managed this project, to introduce you to today's speakers. I really hope that you enjoy today's uh, panel and the different research that we have for you. I think this is a wonderful initiative and one that uh, the ARA will be continue to advocate for moving forward. I'd now like to introduce you to Emma. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, as Caroline mentioned, my name is Emma Woods and I'm the Director of Corporate Services with the ARA. As part of my role, passenger fits within my remit and so I'm going to be facilitating today's webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional landowners on which we meet. Uh, for me, it is the Ngunnawal people and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For any of you that joined us for a webinar throughout 2020, you will uh, hopefully remember that we aim to make these as interactive as possible. So we encourage you to ask questions and take the opportunity to delve a little bit deeper into the knowledge of those who are joining us today. You can ask a question by selecting the little question mark icon and you're welcome to su submit a question at any time throughout the webinar. We have allocated time at the end of today's session where I will put as many questions as possible to our panellists on your behalf. In terms of our structure for today, first we are going to receive an overview of the Faster Rail paper that the ARA commissioned with Arup and Peter Dunn, who is an Associate Principal with Arup and was the lead on the project, will provide the introduction and the overview of the report for us. Peter is a transport planner. He specialises in strategic transport planning, economic evaluation, demand forecasting and transport infrastructure design. He has extensive international experience in major transport projects and project managers Arab's transport related work in both Australia and New Zealand. 
welcome to Peter. We will then move to the National Faster Rail Agency, where we will hear from Andrew Hiles, uh, who is the general manager. Andrew led the establishment of the National Faster Rail Agency in 2019. He previously worked in the Australian Government, Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development for 16 years, where he led work in rail policy and programs, air cargo security, land transport market reform, and also heavy vehicle charging. Thank you to Andrew for joining us today. We're then going to shift to a more state-based focus, where we will hear uh, what is happening in New South Wales and also Victoria. So we'll start with New South Wales, where we will hear from Tanya Orr, who is the Program Director of Fast Rail with Transport for New South Wales. Trans uh, Tanya joined Transport a little over two years ago, bringing a wealth of regional transport planning experience. Prior to this, she worked for the Victorian Government in Transport Planning and Strategy, Joint Venture Commercial Development, Property, Freight Planning, Rail Asset Management, Urban Renewal and Business Case Development for major projects. Hello and welcome to Tanya. And then our final panellist, um, so, so la certainly uh, not least, William Tiepo is the Deputy Secretary for Network Integration with the Department of Transport in Victoria. He has over 23 years experience delivering major transport infrastructure and the operation of the arterial road network across metropolitan and regional Victoria. He has also held executive roles with VicTrack and the City of Greater Geelong. He set up the Network Integration Group and he led the development of Victoria's largest ever rolling stock procurement program and coordination and support for the big build. Thanks for joining us, Will. So a very big welcome and thank you to each of our panellists who are joining us today. Um, before I hand over to Peter to sort of officially kick things off and, and launch the report that we, are, um, we have commissioned, I wanted to first show you a couple of slides on the consumer research that Caroline mentioned. So we commissioned um, a survey of 600 people who are currently employed uh, in metro areas, so Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne, but also regional areas that are currently looking at investing in faster rail, just to really understand what the public sentiment is and potential support for faster rail. And um, we were certainly very encouraged by the feedback and it certainly shows a really strong support both in metro and regional areas. I've got a couple of slides to show you. I will call out some very high level uh, outtakes but we have got the full version on our website. So I encourage you to go there to ara.net.au if you're keen to have a look at some more of the detail and more of the findings. So if we shift over to the first slide, um, obviously many of you would be aware of the change in work patterns that have occurred due to COVID. Uh, the survey indicated that two in five are working from home due to COVID and that three quarters of those surveyed believe that some of the changes that they have made to their working patterns would be permanent. Uh, if we shift on to the next slide, COVID uh, has increased the likelihood of people considering a move out of cities into regional areas. In fact, 30% of city respondents said that COVID had made them more likely to consider making a move to a regional area. Moving on, we also looked at what might be some of the barriers to people moving to the regions. And interestingly, uh, the top barrier was travel distances or the travel times and that they'd simply be too great. So 46% of uh, surveyed participants said travel was a huge barrier for them. Uh, but encouragingly, if we shift over to the next slide, the concept of faster rail connections and, and more specifically providing a rail connection that competes with the time it would take to drive had a real change in seeing people's um, considerations of shifting to regional areas. And in fact, half of the Sydney respondents said that fast rail would improve the appeal of moving out of the city. We then have a couple of slides on regional feedback. Um, so one in five regional residents that were surveyed currently travel by train to city, which is not many. 74% uh, of them drive. And we've got a number of reasons there in that red bar graph in terms of why they choose to drive. Uh, but encouragingly, if we shift to the next slide, 71% of regional respondents said they would make the shift to rail if the travel time was comparable to driving. So as I said at the outset, some really encouraging data around support 
for the concept of faster rail becoming a reality and that people really would make that step change out of their car into a train if the travel times are comparable to driving. Uh, but equally, some of the feedback in there and, and certainly some of the messaging that comes through in the ARIT report is faster rail is one component. It needs to equally be more reliable uh, and more frequent as well. So. I will now uh, introduce Peter to the screen uh, to provide us with a brief on the Faster Rail paper that Arup has prepared for us and uh, that we are officially launching today. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Thank you, Emma. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about um, Faster Rail. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I guess the, uh, um, the, uh, the um, key uh, objective of the report is really to contribute to the fast rail agenda of the federal and state governments. Um, and one of the key themes of our report is uh, rail, rail, fast rail is so much more than an infrastructure project. It's to, to support Australia's future, to catalyse our future and, and better social and economic outcomes for our regions particularly. And I think that's another key theme for our, our small cities and, and regional centres to support them. Um, I'm gonna take you through a bit of an overview of the project. Sorry, can we go to the next slide? Yep. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, a bit of an overview of the project. Um, planning for rail is very complex. There's a lot of issues to consider and I really recommend the reports, an 80 page report and there's a fair bit packed in into there. I'll only give you an overview today. I just want to take the opportunity to thank those at Arup and the ARA members who contributed to this, this report. I really recommend it as a read. Um, and also I guess just want to give a little bit of background on the development of the report because it was actually commissioned in February, March last year. So it's almost 12 months since it was commissioned and was delayed somewhat by the, co the events of COVID. Um, and, and in that sense, it's been interesting developing the report, I guess, in an ever-changing environment. So the report relies a lot on pre-COVID uh, evidence, but also considers the impacts of COVID from past you know, uh, experiences of shocks and, st and stresses. So if we go to the next slide. I think before we start, I just wanted to talk about the definitions of uh, faster rail. Um, there is no standard definition across the world of uh, what is faster, fast or high speed rail and those varying terms have been used in different parts of Australia. For the purposes of the report, to standardise our, our approach, I guess looking at a national level, we've talked about faster rail as a program uh, the, from federal government's program. And then three products, uh, faster rail, which typically operates between 160 and 200 kilometres an hour, fast rail between 200 and 250 kilometres an hour, and high speed rail greater than 250 kilometres an hour. But also a key theme of our report is it's not just about speed. There are a range of factors that contribute to a quality rail system. Um, so next slide. Um, I just want to acknowledge the good work that's been done else, uh, it's been done by federal and state governments. Uh, the federal government have, um, have undertaken a fast rail prospectus and plan and established the National Fast Rail Agency and Andrew will talk more about that later on. Um, and are co-funding a range of business cases in each of the states. Um, and the state governments themselves are, are investing in, in rail as well. Um, I've just highlighted New South Wales are developing fast rail strategy, but obviously the other states are also investing in rail. So the next slide. Um, the first part of our report talks about supporting better outcomes in our regions. And I think that it's an area that hasn't been invested enough in um, historically, and there's an opportunity to address that. Um, the go federal government brought out planning for Australia's uh, future population about a year ago, and that recognises that the uh, that most of our growth, uh, recent growth, has been focused on our three major cities, and there's an opportunity for smaller cities and regional towns to take the pressure off our big cities. But to do that, they need a range of policies and infrastructure to support that. Um, 
So FAF the Rail will be part one of many uh, um, initiatives that support better social and economic outcomes in those regional areas. Um, and I just back up what Emma was saying about um, about people moving to the regions. There has been a trend for the last couple of years for more people to uh, move to the regions. That's certainly been the case during uh, the COVID situation. I think the ABS report uh, that came out the other week, uh, September quarter, showed that, that there have been people moving to the regions. There's a lot of uncertainty about the impacts of COVID, uh, um, but Ultimately, we've got to understand there's a range of potential outcomes and there is a trend of, uh, of uh, people moving to regional areas. And I don't think that, that means cuss the, the death of the, the city either. Um, people will return to the city, but there's clearly an opportunity to um, um, reinforce uh, regional areas. Next slide. Um, planning for faster rail requires an integrated integrated approach. It's not just about faster rail, it requires a range of complementary policy measures, infrastructure uh, to support um, to support to maximise the benefits. Um, the paper outlines a range of examples. Um, um, I've just highlighted a, a few here and I won't talk in detail about them, but we talk about um, the uh, West Coast mainline improvements in the 2000s to, uh, between London and Manchester, which reduced travel times by about 28%. Um, and that really contributed uh, to the really renewal of Manchester. It's not the only thing, of course, a range of other measures, uh, but certainly contributed to some of the, um, some businesses relocating to Manchester, like the BBC headquarters. Um, Cologne to Frankfurt, the high-speed rail between those two centres, uh, provided benefits for some market towns in, in between. And I think that was interesting in the context that those are the smaller towns um, and that improved accessibility, provided economic benefits. And they were actually able to measure that because there weren't, wasn't that much else going on in the region at the time. So sometimes it's very hard to assess in isolation the benefits of, of, faster, of, high, of faster rail. Um, and Lille in France is a hub of high-speed rail in, in northern France, uh, connections to London, Brussels and, and Paris. It's also an interesting story where it had a lot of uh, political support, I guess, and attracted a lot of investment uh, to go with the, those fast rail connections, uh, mainly domestically, but they certainly uh, catalyzed a lot of growth in Lille. Next slide. Um, and we can learn, learn from our past in Australia. And we've just provided uh, regional rail link in Victoria as a, a case study uh, where uh, improvements were made, particularly on the Geelong and Ballarat line, separate, particularly separating them from the uh, metropolitan network, um, which provided significant benefits and re resulted in significant increase in, in, in patronage. Um, it also has coincided with um, increase in population in those regional centres and, and an, also an increase in the gross regional product in, in, the, in those regions. And I think an overall benefit to that project together with the metro projects was just generally contributing to the growth of our rail industry, which has generally been small compared to our, our road industry. Next slide. Um, we talk about why rail is important, you know, the ability to connect regional centres to our capital cities and to each other. Um, we've just provided an example here of connecting Canberra to Sydney, what uh, faster rail, high speed rail might mean in terms of providing um, three hour, four hour connections door to door. Um, so ne the need to think about the network as part of uh, uh, the whole transport network and consider the customer's door to door journey. Um, and that for a city such as Canberra, that's a young city and maturing, there are, there's opportunities there with faster rail connections. There are also in a range of other cities and other states, Newcastle, uh, Geelong, and other like in other locations. Um, so we talk about um, rail provide provides uh, agglomeration benefits. Uh, it allows people to be productive uh, when traveling. It's a sustainable mode and encourages sustainable development around nodes um, and provides safety benefits. And a lot of that's outlined in more detail in the ARA's value of rail paper. 
Um, and also that fast, fast regional rail supports a range of customers. It's not just about commuting, it's about also supporting uh, leisure travel and business travel, tour, tourism, et cetera. Um, and as I said up front, it's not just about speed, it's about reliability, frequency, in, and providing good interchange with other modes, providing good access to it and comfort. Next slide. Um, so we, in the paper, we've considered um, the opportunities and issues associated with our existing networks, um, both at a national level and a state level. And we really think the national level is important. Uh, really, a lot of the work's been done at a state level, but to really bring that up to a national context. Uh, and for example, um, if we're looking at the Albury to Melbourne corridor and looking at the Canberra to Sydney corridor, what does this potentially mean for travel between Melbourne and Sydney in terms of a staged approach to developing our rail network? And also to consider cross-border regions, um, for example, the Riverina and what the connections to Wagga, Wagga Wagga to Victoria and in northern New South Wales to Queensland, for example. Um, we've also, we've considered uh, state by state, and, um, which um, William and uh, Tanya will talk about later in the context of Victoria and uh, New South Wales. Um, we consider the context, each of the states are, are different, in different needs, different settlement patterns, uh, different economies, um, different legacy infrastructure, including different gauges. Um, and uh, topography, you know, in New South Wales, is in, in around Sydney, there's challenging terrain, rugged terrain around Sydney that provides challenges to uh, provide the sort of speeds we need for faster rail. Next slide. And as Caroline's talking about before, our, our network is very slow by world standards. And we've compared on the right some examples of, uh, um, of our current corridors and their lack of competitiveness with road, uh, apart from one corridor. Um, and you know, that therefore is hard for to, to attract a high number of customers. Um, if you can compare that to other locations, we've probably drawn on Europe a fair bit here and some locations in North America, um, rail is more competitive with road. And there are some, North America does experience some similar uh, issues uh, in terms of rail not being competitive with road and there's some initiatives going on there at the moment to address that, particularly in Canada, which I'll talk about later. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and historically we haven't invested in rail over, over the long term and it's really encouraging now at, at a federal level uh, um, and it's encouraging now that the faster rail program is in place um, and and to see the government actually in investing in that. And I, I just encourage that now's the time to invest. You know, I know there's a lot of distraction with, with COVID and what that might mean for patronage on public transport, some uncertainty about that. But our experience of the past uh, is that these things will pass and um, that you know growth will return. Um, and now's actually the opportunity to catch up. And, and, and implement and plan for the future. Next slide. And there's an increasing awareness of resilience and the importance of resilience. Um, and certainly the recent bushfires and COVID have highlighted that in terms of developing a more resilient network. But even on in normal times, our road networks subject to congestion around our larger cities during commuting and holiday peaks. Um, Air travel is often subject to disruption, so mod a modern rail system can actually improve the resilience of, of our network and our ability to adapt to future shocks and stresses. Next slide. We've, we've looked at a couple of examples uh, overseas in terms of other countries that are actually investing in rail now. Um, in Canada, they've actually implemented a high, high frequency rail um, program, which is inter interesting that they've called it that. Um, and that's 
They've investigated high-speed rail and found that to be too expensive um, and they're implementing something that does reduce the travel time, makes it competitive with road. Um, they're looking at the Toronto to Quebec city corridor and improved performance. Um, in Ireland, um, they have implemented uh, targeted and progressive improvements over, um, uh, over the past 10 years. Um, and that's resulted in more frequent and faster travel times to the point where express services between Dublin and Cork are now uh, competitive with road. And that's resulted in increased patronage. Next slide. So what we're saying is targeted improvements are needed. Um, our our rail, rail, rail system is in a poor state and we actually need to address that right, right now to prepare really for faster rail and fast rail improvements to come. Um, we've highlighted over on the right, uh, on the left hand side to the right, uh, some, you know, there's a range of improvements uh, that can be made and are being looked at in different states to improve the rail network. We haven't looked into detail of where and why the states are looking at that. Um, and uh, the far right for fast rail, there may need to be more significant improvements. I think probably the key point uh, with with all of that is all these improvements need to be uh, conscious of our long term objective and our vision for for the for the network. Um, and in some cases, in the design of the system, we might need to make compromise. You know, whilst we might be targeting a speed, it's more about the travel time between uh, from door to door, and there might need to be compromises made in certain locations and design speed compared to impacts on environment and cost, etc. So next slide. Um, we then talk about the opportunities to realise fast rail, faster rail. Um, we talk about uh, staged delivery with a view to the longer term, as we talked about before. Um, that it's important it's integrated with a suite of measures to support our population plan and really understanding that different locations will have different opportunities to uh, reap benefits from faster rail. Not all will reap the same, same benefits. Um, it really requires a consistent policy and governance and funding framework and we need to continue to grow our rail industry and we need to find ways also we also talk in there about developing around our station precincts and some principles around that next slide so we've made six key recommendations i'll just quickly run through that uh, the first one is to de develop a long-term vision for the national rail network and that's really widening the fast rail program at national level to consider the whole rail network um, and develop a, a national plan for it. Um, and also establishing stakeholder community consultation programs to inform the plan and, and generate support for faster rail. Next slide. The second one is to support uh, better social and economic outcomes for the region. So updating regional land use and economic plans, confirming those unique opportunities for each town along the corridor. Um, identifying the complementary measures we talked about before to uh, achieve better social and economic outcomes for our regional areas and engaging with the community and businesses to develop long-term visions for the regional centres. The next one. Um, and establishing a framework for consistent delivery of faster rail and that's working uh, collaborating with uh, Infrastructure Australia to develop a place-based business case and appraisal framework that counts for wider social and economic benefits and also transformational benefits. Um, and to develop a, a national transport network plan to support that, because it's not just about rail, the rail network needs to uh, sit in a uh, integrated transport network to services Australia and supports our population and settlement strategy. And also to learn from our past, you know, learn what benefits previous projects are given, what worked, what didn't, and implement those uh, lessons in you know, informing our, our new projects. Next one. We recommend establishing a, a government's framework to deliver faster rail with the three levels of government working together um, 
and we've talked about mega region deals and that, and that's certainly referenced in the population plan as well in terms of the federal government's population plan. Um, considering models that uh, provide transport authorities the ability to develop station precincts uh, and also identifying clear responsibilities for authorities to realise the benefits of faster rail. So it's engaging early with all the uh, key players and, and and being clear on the roles and who's who's monitoring those. Um, next one. Yeah, so the fifth uh, one is developing a coordinated funding approach and again with the three tiers of government uh, working together to hypothecate funding for faster rail and considering a range of funding mechanisms for faster rail and we talk in there about whilst more funding mechanisms makes it more complex it also mitigates some risk in having a, a series of funding mechanisms we talk in there about like lining up who benefits how they benefit um, how value is created uh, and how it can be funded next slide and the final one is a stage and targeted investment in rail. And that's really the urgent and immediately to address regional rail deficiencies by investing in existing infrastructure to increase uh, speed, frequency and reliability. And secondly, to plan and deliver uh, fast rail over the next five to 10 years to bring the regional rail network up to global standards and be competitive with the road transport. And finally, prepare for high-speed rail in the long term by preserving the corridor. Um, and next slide. So there are our six key recommendations. I think I'll end it there and, and hand back to Emma. Thank you all for listening. Thanks, Peter. It's certainly a comprehensive report, so it's challenging to condense it into sort of a 15 to 20 minute overview. I encourage those who are online to, to jump onto our website and have a look at the full report because um, Peter hasn't, hasn't had an easy task trying to consolidate it for us today. Peter, you wrapped up with the six key recommendations and, and obviously they're, they're not, um, you know, they are designed to sort of occur concurrently. From yep. your perspective, what do you think is sort of the priority first steps that, that need to occur to make faster rail a reality? I think it, it's actually identifying those short-term measures and actions to you know, address the current deficiencies at the same time as planning for the more significant um, uh, um, faster rail to come. So I think it, it really is a, a parallel process and get the governance so you're right, it's all concurrent. Um, so I think there's a range of measure, range of things that actually need to occur in, in parallel. So, you know, apart from actually, you know, doing, uh, you know, upgrading the network, you know, it's planning for the faster rail future because that, that, that takes years to do uh, and, and design. Um, but it's also getting our governance and, and funding approach um, and getting all the key players involved. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Peter. We'll come back to you at the end when we open up for sort of a broader panel question and answers. We're now shifting over to Andrew Hiles, who's the General Manager of the National Faster Rail Agency, and he's here to speak to us today about the agency's agenda. And um, it's, it's quite a broad agenda, and, and we'll certainly touch on some of the elements that Peter has spoken there around governance and funding and, and the need for business cases, of which many are underway. And um, so welcome to Andrew, and uh, thank you for giving us your time and your briefing today. Thanks, Emma. Um, so I think obviously it was good to have Peter's introduction. Um, a number of the things that Peter has mentioned um, in his um, presentation certainly are things that the National Faster Rail Agency is, is, is considering, investigating, um, providing advice to government on. So if, I, if we turn to the first slide, um, uh, or the, so the, obviously the National Faster Rail Agency was established in um, mid last year, so on the 1st of July last year, and it came, was born out of the Planning for Australia's Future Population Strategy. Um, so really, I think, um, you know, government acknowledged that uh, faster rail connections between major capital cities and um, key region, surrounding regional centres were a key opportunity to extend population growth beyond um, particularly Sydney, Melbourne and, and Brisbane. Um, but, you know, the major capital cities into the surrounding regional areas. 
Um, so as part of the, um, the budget last year, the government made a number of additional announcements on investments in faster rail. So um, uh, the government committed $79 million or has committed to date $79 million to nine faster rail business cases. Um, and it's, the government also committed $2 billion to progress um, faster rail from Melbourne to Geelong. Um, and we're obviously working very, very well with our colleagues from Victoria. Um, and it's great to see the Victorian government has made a you know, commitment of $2 billion. So bringing that total commitment up to $4 billion. Um, if we can have the next slide, please. So Peter touched on sort of definitions around faster rail. And I think it's um, absolutely fair to say that there is no kind of common definition of faster rail, um, uh, certainly internationally, but also within Australia. So um, for the purposes of our sort of remit, um, we are really looking at um, faster rail about being improving travel speeds of current uh, faster rail, or sorry, current rail services to achieve speeds up to 160 kilometres per hour. Um, so, you know, in terms of high speed rail, which is obviously talked about, you know, a, a lot over the last decades, um, you know, really that's sort of in the realm of 200 to 250 kilometres per hour, or you, know, you could probably say at least 250 kilometres per hour. Um, Faster rail, you can generally sort of um, upgrade existing tracks, as I think Peter's um, pointed out, um, whereas high speed rail um, generally requires dedicated um, track that can't be shared with other users. Um, so, you know, it's obviously more expensive and far, far longer to implement as well. If we can have the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the National Faster Rail Agency's remit and function, so our, unlike the Department of Infrastructure that we're in the portfolio with, our remit is very much tied to those population outcomes um, uh, being born out of the, sort of the, the population strategy. But our specific functions um, go to things like, um, you know, developing and leading the implementation of the government's 20-year um, Faster Rail plan, um, uh, developing and overseeing business cases with um, state and private sector proponents, um, delivering faster rail construction projects. So we're obviously working with uh, Victoria in, in, the, in the case of Melbourne to Geelong fast rail um, to, to take that forward, um, developing an investment strategy for government um, that sort of covers that fast rail, you know, 20 year fast rail plan period, um, working in partnership with the infrastructure and project financing agency to uh, look at options for value capture and, and um, innovative funding and financing, acknowledging, of course, that, you know, particularly for regional rail connections, that is challenging, um, and also particularly around, um, you know, the political sensitivities around, around um, doing that. Um, so, you know, there are some significant kind of challenges that, that need to be kind of addressed and resolved in partnership specifically with state governments and potentially local government as well. Um, and then finally, we, we sort of have a remit around or a, a kind of a, a function around um, providing advice to the government on future sort of high speed rail corridor protection. Um, obviously, that's a particularly challenging um, uh, function because, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the time frame for high speed rail investments are significant, you know, um, you know potentially sort of 30, 40, 50 years um, before um, governments potentially will be in a position to do it. Um, and, you know, it, it is entirely possible that um, alignments will need to morph and change over time. So trying to work out a sort of an appropriate corridor to protect is, is, is challenging. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of, um, you know, the, the work that we're doing more specifically, um, obviously, as I mentioned before, we're working quite closely with uh, state and territory uh, as well as private sector proponents. Um, to look at opportunities to develop faster rail infrastructure between major capital cities and, and key regional centres. So I mentioned before, um, uh, we've got nine business cases that the government has committed to um, uh, that I'll talk about in, in shortly. Um, so in terms of the business cases themselves, obviously the, the key um, role of a business case is to determine the potential um, uh, for faster rail in each, in each corridor. Um, identify existing constraints and, you know, quantify the costs and benefits of upgrade options. So um, uh, they are significant kind of, you know, um, activities. Um, you know, we need to provide balanced and, and um, uh, defensible advice to government. So they are necessarily quite detailed projects and um, uh, documents that we pull together for those. Um, you know, in, in most cases, you know, running to, um, you know, some, or some cases running to over a thousand pages um, for those, those um, business cases. Um, obviously that helps to inform the development of investment options for each corridor. 
um, around, you know, and then outlining steps um, to guide future investment decisions by government. So our role is really to uh, to take the outcomes of business cases and then provide our sort of assessment, um, expert assessment on on the the opportunities for governments to invest in those those um, corridors and also the, the the costs of doing so. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of um, the faster our business cases that I spoke about, um, obviously to date we've um, overseen the completion of three business cases. So we've worked with New South Wales government um, on the strategic business case for Sydney to Newcastle fast rail. Uh, we worked with Consolidated Land and Rail Australia on on a um, strategic business case for Melbourne to Greater Shepparton, and then uh, we worked with the North Coast Connect consortium to do a detailed business case on the uh, Brisbane to Sunshine Coast um, fast rail uh, proposal. Uh, those have now, they were all completed at the end of 2019, so um, the outcomes of those are informing our advice to governments at the moment. Um, in terms of faster our business cases that are sort of nearing completion, we're um, doing some great work with um, with New South Wales government on um, Sydney to Wollongong and Sydney to Parks business cases. Um, so you know, watch this space for the outcomes of those ones. And then we're working with um, colleagues from Victoria, uh, Queensland, and Western Australia to complete business cases and um, uh, fast rail corridor investigations um, for a number of corridors in those, those jurisdictions as well. Next slide, please. Um, we, in, in addition to doing business cases, we're also, um, we've done quite a bit of um, research and um, uh, analysis on a number of kind of key aspects of uh, the policy uh, framework that underpin fast rail investments. Um, so we, you know, we looked at a state of preference survey. Um, we undertook a state of preference survey at about the end of August, start of September. Um, uh, yeah, surveyed 6,000 residents of Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane on their sort of, um, you know, their uh, working arrangements in COVID. Sorry, during COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as their expectations about future working arrangements. Um, looked at how they're currently travelling, how they're travelling during the pandemic, and how they think those travel plans might change. And then also looked at um, how um, or their sort of their their intentions around um, you know looking to move to regional Australia and also how faster rail might support um, changing those intentions. Um, and it's quite pleasing to see that um, the outcomes of our survey um, uh, align you know reasonably well with the headline outcomes of the uh, ARA's um, own um, survey um, that was presented earlier. Um, we've also done some work on. Um, you know, potential potential alignments or sorry, potential refinements to the infrastructure project evaluation framework. Um, so this is the these are the frameworks that underpin um, the business cases that get undertaken by governments and private sector proponents that feed through to, in our case, Infrastructure Australia. So one of the key challenges is that um, uh, you know those frameworks are incredibly detailed, but you know there are aspects of those um, frameworks that are still on the, the very leading edge of the. The sort of the academic um, uh, economic um, sort of world's um, understanding about you know how you calculate and and quantify um, benefits and costs so we've looked at how you know those frameworks could be refined to to provide a sort of a more balanced outcome as far as the opportunity to invest in you know what we consider would be you know highly transformative projects but projects that won't necessarily pay you know their full range of dividends um, for for probably you know 50 to 100 years plus um, so we fed those um, the outcomes of that work through to the um, uh, ATAP secretariat, the um, um, uh, the group that oversees the um, current evaluation frameworks. But we've also fed it through to Infrastructure Australia as well to inform their their own thinking about evaluate sorry uh, refinements to the framework. Um, we've also undertaken um, you know uh, or done some analysis on international and Australian fast rail case studies. So um, Peter talked about some some of the analysis that um, Arab's done. Um, we've we've looked at a bunch of other corridors as well, both in Australia and overseas. And you know, certainly, I think that demonstrates that there are clear opportunities um, to invest in in faster rail and um, benefits that, that accrue from from that investment. And then we've also um, um, commissioned work on population land use and value sharing modelling, um, just to get a better sense of um, uh, uh, of the opportunities that exist, um, but also to help to kind of um, I guess align um, our understanding of, of of those forecasts across different jurisdictions. So, um, you know, when we work with private sector proponents or state governments, they they potentially use slightly different methodologies 
um, and models to, to to undertake that population land use um, modelling. You know, we we want to be able to apply a a, um, a consistent model um, across all of the business case um, um, uh, corridors that we've looked at to ensure that um, we're we're getting um, like for like outcomes in our analysis. So. All of that um, research um, and analysis is feeding through into our advice to government um, about sort of the opportunities to invest in fast rail, um, and hopefully we'll be able to publish some of that, um, you know, in the in the near future. Um, that's pretty much about it for me. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. You've certainly got an impressive portfolio of work within the agency, so appreciate you taking the time to provide, you know. A high level overview of what you've got going on. Um, you, you talked about the business cases and, and some of the research and you, you started to sort of mention that you know some of it might be forthcoming just as you were wrapping up. Um, I'm sure we've got a lot of industry people on the line who would be super keen to hear when some of the details of, of the business cases and or your research might be available within the public realm and, and where they might go to sort of find details of the various projects that are on the agenda. Are you able to give them some insights in terms of what might be coming out publicly in future? Yeah, look, I think it's um, it's always one of those challenges as a public servant. Um, um, uh, first and foremost, we um, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, are here to serve the, the interests of ministers and, you know, obviously ultimately the Australian public more broadly. Um, you know, we, we think there's some really um, uh, great work that we've commissioned that shows the benefit of faster rail. Obviously, it's up to the government to decide when, when and if that research gets published. Um, we're certainly advising, you know, um, um, that we uh, think that there is benefit in publishing that research to inform the public policy debate. Um, so, look, I think, you know, I, I certainly can't make commitments. It's ultimately a matter for the minister um, and the government of the day, but, um, you know, hopefully it will get published at some point. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Um, now, as I mentioned in the opening, we're going to shift the dialogue slightly and, and have a bit of a briefing from a New South Wales and then a Victorian perspective. Uh, we have Tanya Orr joining us from Transport for New South Wales to provide an overview on the faster rail agenda within New South Wales. So welcome and thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Emma, and, and thanks, Andrew, for a really interesting briefing on where in terms of the federal um, lens on fast rail. Um, really excited to be here today and talk to everyone about where we're up to in, in New South Wales. Um, the New South Wales government announced in late 2018 that it was investing or considering investing in the in a fast rail network across New South Wales. It took a slightly different lens, I guess, in the sense that it's focused very much on re connecting regional centres and um, rather than the capital city to capital city in the first instance, looking very much at connecting people and growing regional New South Wales. And I think um, really welcome the ARA and Peter's paper, the presentation of Peter's paper in adding to that dialogue and consideration of, of how and when and what we would invest in and, and why. And I think from New South Wales perspective, we're very much looking at driving economic growth in regional New South Wales. Um, looking at the customer experience and, and putting a customer lens on, on what we will be delivering, ensuring that we're connecting regionally um, in, in a sort of hub and spoke model, I guess, not just about connecting everyone to Sydney, but actually looking at the regional centres and how we can leverage off an investment in fast rail and improvement in the in the rail offering to, to customers. Um, both people and industry and business in making, giving them better choices of places to live and work. And certainly um, post-COVID, I think one of our focuses definitely, which always has been, but we've certainly been more focused in, in delivering jobs and, and employment in regional centres. But also looking at that place and place making and, and what does that mean and how do we, we leverage off our, our partners across New South Wales government and also with our partners in the federal space and Andrew and his team, we work very closely with them on what that experience and outcome is intended to deliver. And I think one of the, the big challenges for us in New South Wales, and I, I suspect across all of the states that are looking in this space, is um, traditional methods of, of um, evaluating and investing in these programs um, is really challenging when you're looking at something like the New South Wales case, where it would be a 30 year plus investment and timeline and, and trying to overlay traditional 
um, evaluations and benefits analysis on those is always challenging and Andrew touched on that a little bit and I think Peter's paper sort of adds to that dialogue around how do we think about this a little bit differently, um, particularly as we're going to be competing with other investments post-COVID I think and understanding the post-COVID people movement. Um, you know, a lot of people are working from home. Um, will that continue? Will people move back to cities? Will they move to regional centres? Um, I think certainly New South Wales is currently experiencing quite a, a, a change in, or it, it appears to be, anecdotally appears to be a significant change in people moving out to um, the south coast, the north coast, and regional New South Wales over into the west. Um, and so, you know, it's part of that was already happening before COVID, but certainly COVID has made that, made that more attractive as we go forward. Um, people probably understand this, but just to, to reiterate the potential routes that, that we have been investigating, there's four. There's the northern route, which is Sydney through Central Coast, Newcastle and Port Macquarie. Um, the western route, which is Sydney through Lithgow, Bathurst to Parks. Um, the south, the south um, towards Canberra, Sydney to Canberra. And then also the coastal route, looking at Sydney to Wollongong and Bomaderry. And down following that coastline. And that, that east coast um, corridor in regional New South Wales has a significant amount of movement. I think Newcastle to Sydney, um, people movement, not rail, but people movement between those two cities is probably the biggest, largest amount of people movement in the country. And yet, those of you on the call would know the investment in that rail corridor has probably um, not matched people's expectation, and therefore, there's a significant amount of of car traffic travelling between those two centres at the moment. And I think um, you know, I think part of our offering will be looking at providing genuine options and choices for people, alternative choices for people in transport. And that's not just a fast rail commitment, that's a transport for New South Wales commitment across all the, the um, areas of transport that we, we certainly look at. Um, I think in terms of the regional and, and customer lens, I think this is something we've all talked about quite a lot. You know, in my time in Victoria and certainly New South Wales, we talk about that customer lens and customer outcomes, we talk about growing regional communities. I think the work for us very much is about making that case for what do people and communities and customers achieve by leveraging off an investment in something as transformational as fast rail and, um, and how do we use this as a catalyst for those things and also helping us make the case for that investment. Um, again, I think everyone on this call would appreciate the challenges we all have in, in making the case for investment in rail. It's expensive, it's technically challenging in comparison to simply, uh, simply in comparison to, to building a new road and yet we know that that mass people movement, um, the choice, the customer experience that can be achieved through providing a genuine choice and, and better option for travelling on a train, um, particularly if you were working, um, coming into a, into Sydney for, for um, services such as health, education, um, work, um, those sorts of things are really critical for people who live in regional New South Wales and really some of the choices that are on offer are less than, than ideal and often people, it's just easier to jump in your car and, and drive. But we, so we certainly do have a, a vision for um, growing those regional economies and understanding what that will mean, um, helping create jobs and keeping jobs in regional New South Wales as we evolve out of, out of COVID. It'll be fascinating to see some of the data and analysis that comes out of this post-COVID um, post time and where and what support that will give us for investing in something as transformational as fast rail. Um, I don't, uh, I'm sorry, customer at the centre was the other was the other area that I wanted to touch on and really understanding we've got such a vast, rich amount of data um, that we've accumulated over a period of time on what customers want, what our various customers need and how that works for them living in their communities and their work, um, rest and play if you like, um, and how do we interpret that into something that's genuinely understandable for some, and, and also being able to communicate to those customers that the amount of time that it will genuinely take for this to, to occur and for those changes to happen. I think Andrew's paper um, is pretty positive on that, that sense of let's go at this in an incremental way. Let's look at what we can do to improve the existing network. Some of the data in Andrew's paper talks about the average speed um, on most of the networks, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, I think is sitting about 60 kilometres an hour 
Um, you know, even improving on that just on the existing network would be a revelation for some customers who use those networks in regional Australia and regional New South Wales. Um, let them then building up to a much better fast burn network um, on offer in addition to the existing network that operates. Um, so I guess just in, in finishing and, and you know happy to answer some questions when we get to the panel stage, you know, the opportunities for us are about making a step change in transport choices for people in regional New South Wales and out of metropolitan Sydney. Um, some of the challenges are around how do you measure the benefits and outcomes for a program that is over a 30 year period, not a traditional period for a project or program, focusing on those customer and regional development outcomes and managing our way through the traditional methodologies of investment. And you know, certainly our relationship and partnership with Andrew and his team um, has been really rich in, in investigating and thinking about that a little bit differently and how we work together with the federal and state government. Um, Emma, that's probably all I can say. I'm sure people will have lots of more specific questions for me um, and, and I'm sure Victoria as we go and I'll do my best to answer what I can, but I thought that was hopefully giving people a bit of a broad lens of, of the areas and how we're looking at, at this and you know where I can happy to answer more specific questions. That's fantastic. Thank you, Tanya. Um, certainly a lot of interest in, in what's going on in New South Wales coming through to the questions and I, and I will come to them in some of the panel discussion. But you, you and um, Andrew and Peter have all highlighted the importance of faster rail, faster rail being part of an integrated transport network. We can't look at it as a, you know, a line on its own. Um, you mentioned the four routes that are being explored in New South Wales. How, you know, what priorities, I suppose, will the government give to economic benefits over social benefits, over, you know, things like placemaking and what have you and, and the impact on the regions? How do you think they're going to try to determine which route they go with first? <laughs> That's a really good question. And it's a really challenging thing for us to do. I think, you know, really that going to my comments about customer and regional development, I think it's incumbent on us to make those cases for what opportunities there are to go beyond the faster rail service, which is important, but not the only area we'll be looking at really, how can we leverage off um, an investment in one of those corridors? Where do we start is a really good question. Sometimes it could be about ease of making a change. So some of the earlier projects might be low hanging fruit where straightening a particular section of the existing corridor um, produces a faster service for the existing network into much bigger, broader transformational change for certain sections of the region. Um, as you know, and I think as Andrew alluded to, and none of us are immune to this, it will depend um, on you know investing in regional improvement, I think will be a priority for, for this government and any government. Um, also, in a sense, the benefits that are derived in some of the passenger services that are the, the movements that exist. So, you know, again, talking about that Sydney Newcastle, obviously that's the largest movement of people in New South Wales. So therefore one argument could be, well, let's go there first. Another could be, well, regional New South Wales and out to the west and, and you know there's a strong freight um corridor there. So therefore, you know, so I think some of those things will just um come through in the wash and and um but hope I think genuinely Transport for New South Wales and the New South Wales government is genuinely looking broader than just traditional economic benefits, but looking at customer benefits, customer outcomes, and opportunities to genuinely see regional development occur off the back of that. That's really, really encouraging, and it certainly aligns to to one of the key recommendations from the report. And and as um, Andrew was saying, you know, looking at refining the project evaluation framework. Thank you, Tanya. We'll come back to you for the panel discussion. So we're now going to invite mm -hmm. William Tiepo to the, I was going to say stage, virtual stage, our, um, our screens to provide a briefing on faster rail or the fast rail agenda within Victoria. Uh, and in many ways, Victoria is kind of leading the country. So um, excited to hear from you, William, in terms of what's happening um, down in Victoria. Thank you for joining us. And thanks, Emma. Um, I think, um, like you said, I think we're pretty lucky in Victoria. There's been a significant amount of investment um, over a number of years, but uh, but more recently, obviously, both the federal and state governments have um, yeah, really committed uh, a lot of initiatives um, to our regional uh, rail network, as, as well as not only just um, 
the Geelong uh, to Melbourne route, but also all the other sort of connecting um, you know, major city regional routes, which is really you know, similar to what um, Tanya was saying. You know, we've got a traditional uh, hub and spoke sort of network that sort of comes into Melbourne and, and reaches out into those regional regional areas. But um, I guess what I'd like to do is sort of sort of cast the net about cast the net back a little bit um, in Victoria, and I guess there's probably been two or three uh, catalyst um, sort of projects that have sort of happened over the last ten years that have really um, sort of shown um, you know, what what improvements to regional rail uh, can do, and and you know, Peter's report covers nearly all of those. Um, and I and I look back at you know 2006 we, where we had regional fast rail. Um, which was really just bring, bringing up um, track speeds on, you know, the main corridors of Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, Tarelgan, um, and then also introducing, you know, new rolling stock, which is our, you know, uh, our velocity trains um, um, that are predominantly the backbone of, you know, V-Line's regional network. So, and they're, they're continuing to provide, you know, really good feedback from the communities and, and, how, they're, and how they're operating and, and um, you know, talk about customer outcomes, you know, comfort levels, and those sorts of things. So, and I think Peter, you covered um, a fair bit around you know the the, the um, regional rail link that was built back in 2015, um, and that has been overly um, super successful um, to the point where you know it's we've got huge um, you know growth in Tarnit and and Windenvale on the Geelong line uh, on the regional rail line and. Yeah, just to give you a bit of an indication, just over the last, you know, since that project opened, um, yeah, the patronage levels on the Geelong corridor have have risen by about 191 percent. So I, I think you know it's been overly successful, and and obviously some of the things that we're looking at now and our, our next agenda is around, yeah, you know, how do we actually serve those peri-urban areas, but also um, provide that connectivity to the regions and. Um, Living in, you know, living in Torquay and and sort of just outside of Geelong, I can understand uh, have, and have you know that regional sentiment on what people are actually looking for, and um, particularly for Geelong to Melbourne, um, they are looking for um, not only just faster travel times, but they're also looking at more reliable and frequent services, which is you know what Peter covered in in his report. Um, and I guess the other the other the, the other um, successful factor, I guess that you know, that we need to consider is um, when you've got, um, you know, regional rail that we've, you know, as, as we have in Victoria, um, there's also a large conversation that's happening with the communities around, you know, particularly in regional communities around how do you actually get people to these regional lines? You know, you've got to make sure that our buses are connecting, the coaches are connecting to those services, and, and people are, are also opting for active transport connections to these uh, to these um, regional stations. So, you know, obviously a lot of the work that we're doing on the regional rail revival program, you know, focuses on, you know, connectivity to those stations, um, you know, storage of bikes and all those sorts of things that actually provides uh, those those um, sorts of things that we need to look at. Um, I guess I've talked about regional rail revival uh, program and that's, um, you know, over the years it started off with a nearly $2 billion program, but it's, you know, with both federal and state government commitments, um, that's now grown out to about uh, around about four billion dollar program, um, and that has been um, th that has been uh, you know we just saw a successful opening of the Ballarat line upgrade, which is one of the first um, lines that have been opened as part of um, or upgraded as part of the Triple R program, and and just to give you a bit of, of a bit of an idea, you know since that you know we, we've been able to introduce. Um, you know, we've gone from 68 services per day to 99 services per day on the Geelong, on the Ballarat line, um, and you know, increased the the reliability of that line uh, since that um, program was, um, in, you know, since that program, you know, that that line went live on the 31st of July, uh, January. So I guess, you know, we we one of the other things that, and and Tanya would know about this of being in Victoria previously. Um, it was really, you know, the whole regional rail revival program, which does look at, you know, um, you know, reducing travel time and and um, comfort and all those cool sort of customer sort of outcomes that we want to try and look at. Um, but that sort of is revolving around what, you know, what we've developed um, a few years ago. Um, that is the uh, regional uh, network development plan, which is really a key strategy that the government uh, have targeted the regional rail revival program for both federal and state governments, you know, to target these are the sorts of things that, you know, each of the corridors need to achieve. 
um, and and the scope of those projects uh, on each of the regional lines have been uh, purely focused around yeah you know, how do you reduce the travel how do you reduce the travel time how do you provide some more frequent services to those regional centres um, and, um, and and you know and how many a day that you want to achieve so I think um, yeah having that strategy has been a real uh, key implementation factor of you know faster services in the regions um, and yeah you know, the success of Ballarat line upgrade you know which was the first one. Um, that's come live uh, since the the Triple R program started um, has has already paid off um, um, yeah significant benefits in 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 that as well. So work you know works underway on the on the Gippsland line. Um, we're also seeing you know um, and Peter's got it in his report around you know some of the 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 metro sort of regional metro uh, networks and. We've seen it in Geelong where people are starting to commute from Warren Ponds into the city without having to need to drive and park their cars. And we've seen the reverse commute as well uh, in Geelong where we've got a huge um, spike of people that live in the sort of Lara, Werribee area wanting to come into Geelong to work. So that's that's providing some of the benefits there. Um, and, and part of that going forward is part of the regional revival, regional revival, revival program um, we'll continue to sort of deliver those sorts of benefits. And um, and I guess probably the last thing is around, you know, the Geelong to Melbourne. I think we've been working very closely um, with Andrew's group and um, and the Commonwealth to to have both governments commit to a $4 billion, you know, stage one of Geelong farce is um, a significant milestone. And, um, you know, still a challenging project, but, I'll, you know, Rail Project Victoria in Victoria will deliver that project. and. But, you know, planning and uh, planning and uh, development of that project and the business case is now well underway. Um, and I guess some of the things that we've heard from from key stakeholders in Geelong is, you know, speed's not necessarily what they're looking for, which is pretty aligned with what what, what you were saying before, Peter. Um, and it, it does come down to, you know, how do we actually, where do we um, want it, you know, where do people actually want to travel to? And and I guess for Geelong commuters, you know, that, you know, they they do want to have that choice of reconnecting to uh, to, to the Werribee area, um, where there is significant growth in Hoppers Crossing Werribee, and they do want to commute back uh, and to from Geelong, um, and and they also have the opportunity in, in the long term to even um, have uh, Geelong connected uh, on the RL, which which it is today. Um, and that will uh, provide um, that connectivity to the airport. So um, when when the airport rail link's completed. So I guess we talked about integration. I guess one of the key things we've been trying to do in, in Victoria is make sure that the planning that we're doing on the rail network, um, particularly how the regional and the metro networks integrate, um, gives people that flexibility. It integrates the, the network. I guess one of the biggest challenges we have and probably other states do as well is is um is how do we uh, make sure that we're not forgetting about freight so that that has been uh, something that we're we're very mindful of and and we've got to make sure that we're planning uh for freight and they're the sorts of things that peter identified in his reports around you know passing loops and making sure that we can still maintain passenger services as we want to but how do we make sure that we're not um um you know making sure that freight's still efficient as well so that has been a big challenge because of the the volume of work and development and investment that's happening in the, the the rail network in Victoria, is that we've had to you know very much integrate um, you know the, the freight and passenger services to make sure um, that sort of works out and and we're, and we're not precluding future freight happening from from um, from from growing. Um, and I guess the other things that we've got to consider too is um, it's not always uh, an infrastructure solution. Um, and I guess we've seen that in Victoria where we've been able to change uh, service and timetable changes. We've been able to do it sometimes without infrastructure. Sometimes uh, we, we look at a different rolling stock solution. So some of the work that we're doing, obviously for Geelong to Melbourne, um, fast rail and um, some of the regional uh, Western rail plan work that we're doing uh, uh, at the moment that the government's committed to doing for how do we improve um, faster services to Ballarat and Geelong. Um, you know, some of those things are not just infrastructure. We've also got to look at the innovations around technology um, and what are the what are the different types of rolling stock that you know could serve us in the future. But making sure we're planning the network 
and the infrastructure so we're not precluding uh, a different type of rolling stock in the future. So, um, so look, I think Emma, there's a lot going on in Victoria, pretty exciting. I think there's a lot of um, good industry uh, engagement. I, I guess the challenge that we all have in probably most states, and I can probably talk about this on behalf of most states, is that our rail skills, you know, we do need to do a collective piece of work uh, on rail skills and how do we actually build um, the rail skills and particularly, I think, you know, Peter, you raised, raised in your report around rail signalling um, and those sorts of and those sorts of skills are pretty um, uh, pretty challenging to try and get here in Victoria, particularly with the volume of um, of work. But um, I think uh, you've hit the mark, Peter, on your report. I think it's all the key learnings that we've learnt in Victoria and and where we're heading to. So it's a pretty exciting time. Thank you, William. It's certainly a, an impressive program of work that has been delivered and, and is still being delivered today. So thank you for providing us with that overview. Um, you talked about a lot of, you know, what has been achieved. Is there sort of a number one lesson, a sort of a aha, we should have done that differently moment that you could share that, that perhaps some of the other jurisdictions might be able to take away? Yeah, I, I think um, one of the, probably one of the lessons learned is, is probably something that Peter's talked about is, um, is it's not just about faster rail and and for us one of the things that we've taken away particularly for the Geelong to Melbourne work that we've done is um, things that I just spoke about before you know people do want to be connected to different places and um, and we, we've got to make sure that the services and the infrastructure and the and and the projects we're delivering is actually delivering on outcomes from the community so Really asking the community what where they want to go, having some really good data, and and that can help um, you know that, that can actually help shape your um, the, the service plans, the stopping patterns you do for all these all these projects that we're we're doing at the moment, um, and it, and actually make sure that people are connecting to where they want to go, um, and I think that's probably one of the key um, you know. It, yeah, you know, one of the key sort of takeouts for me. It's not just about fast travel time. It's a, it's a, it's about connecting people to where they want to go, in the in the yeah you know, in the most efficient way um, and reliably. So, yeah, uh, absolutely, I agree. It was certainly one of the key takeouts for us. We'll bring back the other panelists now. I'll get them to pop their cameras back on and and microphones so we don't have a 2020 you're on mute moment. Um, we've had a number of questions come through from people on the line, so, so thank you and, and you can continue to put in your questions. I'll do my best to get through them. We don't have a lot of time, so we'll have to try and cover a broad amount of ground in, in a brief amount of time. Um, the RAW skills comment that Will launched into at the end, we actually have had a question, and Andrew, I might direct this to you. In terms of the business cases that are being led, is there a consideration for the skills gap that are being faced and, and how we might sort of address the skills challenges being faced by the industry? Yeah, look, so certainly from our perspective, um, the detailed business case that we've done on the, say, this um, Brisbane to Sunshine Coast Corridor did definitely look at um, uh, deliverability of the project um, and so the um, proponents undertook a market sounding and engagement process to, to talk to um, potential uh, market participants in, in a sort of a construction project um, to find out their sort of views about deliver aspects of deliverability. One of the pieces of feedback that they got through that process was around um, ensuring that this sort of the um, the, the staging was broken down small enough so that you know a broader range of um, industry participants could could potentially put forward bids. Um, so that that certainly fed through to the the way the project staging was um, was identified in the business case. Um, it's something that I know that my colleagues in the Department of Infrastructure um, are very uh, attuned to, um, and certainly we've had kind of internal conversations with with those people about um, um, the. The risks and challenges that go to that. Um, obviously, governments are very focused on ensuring that projects get delivered. Once they've committed, they get delivered on time and, and to budget. And and skills are, uh, is one of the core components of sort of achieving that outcome. So um, there's there's a lot of work I think being done at the moment on that issue. If we jump to another topic now, Peter, we've had a question come in around the comparison of road and rail journey, journey times and, and sort of the global comparison that you included in your report. The question is, um, are those journey times based on door to door or, or is it is and is it taking into account that last mile component or is it more sort of station to station or, you know? 
it's broadly station to station. So we, we've, you know, compared, you know, you know, pretty much a central to central uh, sort of journey time. Um, thank you. Now, Tanya, if we if we come to you, you, you sort of talked about the focus on regional communities and and alluded to the fact that you know the importance of community engagement. How have you engaged regional communities to to Will's point to really understand what is important to people in regional New South Wales in in providing these changes to to their rail services? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. It's a good question. I think a number of ways. So we. There was a piece of work initially kicked off by the New South Wales government back in at the beginning of 2019 to look at the strategic lens of what this might look like, a fast rail network might look like. But we are a very connected division, and I know some people will giggle at that potentially because sometimes public servants do struggle with being connected. But there is a lot of work being done in the New South Wales um, transport for New South Wales on bringing together all those customers. There are customer, specific customer area focused areas who are engaging every day in regional and out of metropolitan New South Wales. We've got teams that are out there based in all the regional centres and talking constantly to their customers. So it's not a one size fits all. And certainly at the right time, um, we will specifically continue to engage on fast rail. But it's not just a fast rail. I think if we stay too focused on that traditional project, look at let's just look at this one bit of project, I think we end up delivering at times not that right customer outcome. So keeping that broader lens um, and, and looking at it region by region too and, and place by place. I think, you know, in William's point around the work that they've done in Victoria, you look at the Ballarat Bendigo um, change is very different to what we've done with Geelong because Geelong was very much a congestion, get more people moving kind of thing. Ballarat and Bendigo has transformed the way people can live in those cities and travel to. And it's the same up here in Newcastle and Wollongong, Orange and Bathurst. You know, the Bathurst bullet in New South Wales is a classic example of um, where potentially that some of the analysis didn't really say that that would be a highly used service and yet when it was put in place, it was oversubscribed within two weeks. They had to put more services on. And, and that's really responding to that genuine customer need as opposed to looking at traditional methods, which is what I was talking about earlier. So, yeah, it, it's an ongoing journey and it's not something that should be a one-size-fits-all. We've, we've engaged with you once, that's it. <laughs> We're taking it offline. It's got to be a continuous, evolving discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And... um. William, Geelong, the Geelong fast rail route is obviously a very hot topic at the moment. How did community engagement influence that project today? Well, I guess um, a lot of the things that we're, we're doing at the moment is, um, you know, some of the options um, as part of the business case is, you know, the, the, the route via Werribee is eight kilometres shorter than the regional rail. And and I guess there was a whole range of different factors that, that came up with not only just that route, but... Um, how um, yeah, obviously the thing what I spoke about before was you know there was a there was um, stakeholder input into you know where, where the desire is for people to you know to travel to so so that was that was one factor and and I guess the other factor uh, for that project was or for that particular rail scheme was to actually say you know that the you know the section between Sunshine into the city is is one of the highly uh, congested parts of the network so if we can provide more um, you know, free up some paths on on that part of the network to actually run some more services for those peri-urban areas. That sort of uh, also was a contributing factor to also still having Geelong going via regional rail link, but also freeing up some paths um, to actually service the, the west a little bit better, um, and and also giving Geelong you know an express track um, you know through between Laverton and Werribee, which is you know the 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 first part of what we've got to develop um, over the next year and a half. Yeah. yeah. So really reinforcing the need to step back and take that bigger picture view. Um, yeah. Andrew, one of the recommendations in Arab's paper that we've launched today is about developing a national vision or a national plan for the rail network in Australia. So I guess picking up on that comment, obviously National Faster Rail Agency is focused on faster rail. Has there been consideration about stepping it back and, and developing a whole rail plan for Australia? 
Yeah, look, I think there was um, a lot of um, good information was con contained in the um, uh, the the 20-year um, fast the government's 20-year faster rail plan. So that talked about kind of you know the broad policy objectives, the criteria, um, you know, that the focus around different parts of the country, um, that sort of thing. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the kind of the risk with this is you get sort of um, spend a lot of time. Um, you know, focusing on doing a plan and not actually doing, you know, the actual work, um, working with jurisdictions, working with proponents to actually kind of look at the, the real options and opportunities. Um, so I think, you know, we, we certainly um, maintain active um, contact with state, state um, governments and uh, uh, we do that through an a, a inter-jurisdiction kind of working group um, where we're sort of ensuring that there's information sharing between jurisdictions, um, that we're sharing the latest um, you know, we certainly don't have it. Well, it's been some fantastic work that's been done in states. Um, things around, you know, Queensland has done some fantastic work on regional planning. Victoria has done some fantastic work on on their regional rail investments, as um, as Will's pointed out. New South Wales has been doing some brilliant work on on their sort of their their um, faster rail strategic planning. Um, so, you know, we offer that opportunity to to share um, those lessons between jurisdictions. So, I think, you know. Broadly speaking, there's kind of a, a good understanding about kind of what we need to do. We just need to actually start doing it. Full support from ARA for that, uh, Andrew. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I'm having trouble keeping on top of all the questions coming through, I must be honest. So I apologise to those on the line if I don't get to your question. Um, but William, we've, we've heard a lot about Geelong, the, the stage one. It implies there's a stage two. Um, can you give us any indications of, of what might be coming down the pipeline? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, one of the things, and one of the other key learnings I was going to mention before, you know, on top of what I already said, Emma, was, um, you know, what, you know, obviously you would try and, you know, we, we want to try and reduce as much travel time uh, on that corridor as much as possible, but how do you start to deliver, how do you deliver benefits quickly um, in a staged way? And, and I guess one of the things that we've looked at is, you know, the first stage is really trimming 15 minutes off a trip and that can actually bring some benefits a, a lot earlier um, instead of going a big bang approach and do the whole kick a birdle, which is quite expensive, um, needs a lot more planning. So one of the, you know, the approach we've taken here is what are the things that we can actually deliver quickly um, and um, things that are really beneficial for, um, for for all the commuters, but deliver it as quickly as we possibly can, without without having um, you know five or ten years of planning uh, for a mega mega project. So so we, we think stage one is is a really good win for Geelong, you know, fifteen minute saving. Um, but you know we're also like Peter was saying is we've got to keep our eye on the ball on what is the next stage, and we've still got to do that work. But we're not you know the work that we're doing on stage one doesn't preclude um yeah doing more work um um on future stages so we've, we've got we've got some options that you know we're looking at and and there's a lot of you know um configuration um you know um you know options that we're developing you know for that but but really at this point in time that you know we're concentrating on delivering the benefits for stage one um and um and, that, and that's what the government's committed to do so both governments yeah and that really reinforces Andrew's comment around, you know, it makes it more manageable from a skills perspective, et cetera, and, and really chunking it up so it is more deliverable for the industry. Um, Peter, there's been a lot of talk today around the evaluation framework and so, you know, support for the recommendation around changing how we evaluate our projects to recommend or to realise and acknowledge the broader benefits that, yep. you know, faster rail could provide, particularly, you know, for the, the New South Wales regional focus. Can you elaborate a little bit on your thinking in that space in terms of what some of those broader benefits um, are and what could be recognised? Sure. Um, it's probably to acknowledge there certainly agent, uh, um, the IA and also the state agencies are looking at place-based uh, and reviewing appraisal frameworks at the moment. but. I guess in lessons learned from, you know, we've had a traditional approach for a long time with respect to project evaluation based on benefit cost ratio, travel time benefits, which has sometimes held back um, projects which might hold a longer term uh, um, transformational uh, change for, 
for, for Australia. And I think it's interesting to look at other ways some other countries are doing things, you know, the UK and, and New Zealand with their four stage sort of uh, business case approach, um, you know, with very much a strategic business case up front, a vision led type approach, looking at a range of measures be before you get down to justifying the, the individual measure. Um, I think the way things are planned in the Netherlands also a good example, and they, they really put a lot of store in, I guess, planning their cities together and, and, and their networks together to, you know, more fully define the project before it gets to the um, individual solution. Um, so I think, you know, there's opportunity and what Andrew was talking about before, I think in terms of actually quantifying uh, some of the wider economic and social benefits and transformational benefits, there's a lot of experience we can bring on from other locations and, and, and draw in here, but clearly doing it a traditional way with a discount rate of 7% or whatever, you know, just crushes uh, public transport projects. Yeah. yeah. But there's no point reinventing the wheel. I'm all for big borrowing no. and stealing if it works for someone else. <laughs> um, we're almost out of time. So super quick final question to each of you. Um, in your respective areas or jurisdictions, what do you think will be the, the one thing that will shift the dial to make faster rail a reality in Australia this year? Will, your top of screen, I will start with you. Righto. Um, well, I guess... I guess for us it, it will be, um, you know, making sure we can, you know, make the most of the investments that the government's got now and how do you get the best um, possible outcomes out of the investments that we've got currently got at the moment to deliver the best um, outcomes. So that, that's probably the, the key thing in, in doing some good planning, good community engagement um, to, to really, you know, gauge and making sure you're delivering, you know, what the customer really wants. Yeah, brilliant. Andrew from the Faster Rail Agency. Uh, look, I have to be careful being a public servant. Um, I would say, you know, the, the most important thing is that we start the journey, you know, that that um, I think there's a sort of a risk in getting kind of, um, um, I guess, overtaken by kind of bright, shiny, high-speed rail, kind of all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think that, you know, that that's possibly led to some kind of, you know, um, I guess, um, uncertainty around the, the right direction to take. I think um, incremental investments, um, you know, we've seen it work fantastically for our um, national highways. Um, so I think, you know, we, we just need to start taking the journey. And once we've started the journey, um, you know, the federal government's only recently got involved in this, in, 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 in a, you know, um, passenger rail, regional passenger rail investments. Um, there has been sort of a, a few projects previously, but, um, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity and hopefully we'll see some, um, some real progress made. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, Peter, what about you? If you could see one thing happen this year in the faster hour space, what would you like it to be? I think for me, it's, it's kind of repeating what I said earlier, really. I'm going to say two things. I'm going to cheat. Um, <laughs> that, um, it's, it's really about implementing, I think what William was saying about the Geelong corridor, for, for, for example, you know, the, the no regrets investment and, and really pushing that but also to plan for the future as well, so we know where we're going. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in that space as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been really positive uh, uh, in terms of the fast rail program, which is great. Oh, it's an exciting space to be in, and we've certainly mm -hmm. heard today just how much is going on. Tanya, we'll conclude with you. Um, if you could see one thing happen in New South Wales this year in relation to faster rail, what, what would you like it to be? Oh, we, look, we'd certainly like to see projects get underway. I think, you know, all of that everyone said is, is relevant and particularly Peter's comment, keeping an eye on the long term and keeping that vision whole, but while looking at the short term investments and, and inter interventions, if you like, that start that journey and build the momentum, um, not only for our governments who ultimately decide, but also for our community and customers who also need to buy into the dream vision <laughs> and I think you mentioned it earlier Tanya as being a step change it certainly is a step change I mean we're talking about faster rail here in Australia but we're not really talking about it in other countries around the world because their networks are already at the speed that we're striving to achieve so um, look, can, I probably add, sorry, can I just add one thing to that um, and it's probably challenging back to you a little bit is I think it's also managing expectations you know, the notion of asking us all what could we do this year that would have a step change in fast rail, I think that's exactly part of the challenge is trying to find a solution that's it. Because rail, as we all know, 
is a, is a long term commitment, even to smaller projects. It's not something that you can just go out there and yeah. Yeah. build it. Yeah, it's got to be it's got to be understood to be a long term thing. So I think commitment and and those sorts of things are really important and. Mm -hmm. And just understanding that we're all working together and, and engaging with all our partners um, to get get on with it, if that makes sense. Well, uh, absolutely. Uh, we're not going to achieve faster rail in 21. Um, it, it's a gradual process. And I completely agree yeah. with you, Tanya. Look, a huge thank you to all of you for joining us today. And uh, apologies to those on the line whose questions I didn't get to. Um, it's certainly been an incredibly popular session um, and a great way to kick off our webinar program for 2021. Uh, fantastic to launch the Faster Rail paper. Thank you to you, Peter, for launch uh, for leading that process for us. The report itself and the survey that I highlighted at the beginning are all available on our website. We've got the URL there on our screen. But I think we've really stressed, and, and as Tanya highlighted just at the end, needs to be a staged approach. So we cannot overlook the value of investing in our existing networks as an immediate priority. Uh, look to building new lines as sort of a, a medium to medium term priority in terms of fast rail. And then, of course, the long term option is your visionary concept with faster rail, high speed rail all the different terms um, and therefore the need to, to preserve that corridor which um, Andrew sort of has carriage of at the moment in terms of how to recommend an approach to government. So a big thank you to everyone who has dialed in, a big thank you to each of our panellists for your time and sharing your information and expertise with us. Uh, I've certainly thoroughly enjoyed it so I'm sure those on the line have as well. Have a lovely afternoon everyone, stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.